It's going to be a good day for our dear friend Eleanor, who made it in time for the service. I know she gets upset when the bus drivers get her here late, and here she is. Woohoo! <laughs> We are, good morning and welcome to Weston Park. We are making our way through the liturgical season of Lent where we've reached week five. Pastor Allen has created a nutrition-rich sermon series for the occasion, Jesus, the Bread of Life. Each week we are offered bread for this journey we are on together. We've been asked some challenging questions that sustain us even as they linger, if we take them seriously. The beautiful and somewhat haunting wisdom of Ecclesiastes, do the most with your life that you can. The strong and powerful directives from Deuteronomy, called to live in obedience, it is written. It is written, Jesus responded to the tempter in the wilderness, where he was tested following his baptism. We hear, and what will we do with what we hear? That continues to be a question not only to the characters in the Bible, but to us, the readers. God's story continues through our very own lives. We've been praying for friends and family in our midst who have made the decision to follow Jesus into and through the waters of baptism. What a celebration it will be next Sunday for each of them as well as for us. The question before us today, what gives meaning to your life? I've been looking forward to this message What gives meaning, not just purpose, but meaning? As we prepare to worship together, let us bow our heads. Lord, we gather and humble ourselves before you this day, together. We come from busy weeks. We come from troubling news. We come full of joy. We come with sorrow. Most important, We come, we come in confidence that you are in our midst. We come to see and recognize you in our midst. Help us lay aside the knots and tangles that preoccupy and trip us up. Help us to recognize the problems and challenges that seem to plague us. Those things that can become doors and windows into your plans and purposes in and for our lives. If we seek you with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our minds, help us to take the care and share the concern of our neighbor that we take for ourselves. Open our eyes and the ears of our hearts to hear you clearly this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
morning. Those songs were awesome. <laughs> I let you in on a little secret. Songs and hymns are priors. That's a secret. The only thing that we are here to do is to glorify the name of Jesus Christ, magnify him, and give him praise. And when we sing songs, and when we sing hymns, and when we read psalms, they are prayers. And this morning, as a community prayer, we all have prayed and sang praises unto our God and Father. And I just think that, what am I going to pray, God? We have, we have done it. We have done it. We have did it. Wonderful song selection, Pastor. They are lovely. Nonetheless, that's my duty. Let us, um, in this moment of community. Over the, um, the weekend, I was thinking, this Lenten season, a lot going on, sickness, you know, issues, struggles, a lot going on. But one thing I know that the Bible tells us that Jesus said, those who give him praise and believe in his name, he said, signs and wonders will follow them. So this morning, as a community, as you have already assisted me in praying for our community by singing those wonderful songs, we just want to lift up those who are going through some challenging times in health-wise and you know, in other areas of their lives. Let us pray. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within, within us. Lord God, we come here this morning to give you thanks, to give you praise, to give you glory. Because, Lord God, we know that it is only you who have, can forgive our sin and who will heal our disease. And you have done it many times, Lord God. How deep and how wide, Lord God, is your love we just sang. Lord God, you sent your only son, for you loved us, you sent him unto us as our Passover lamb, our faithful one, our faithful witness. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the King of glory, the Lord of lords, and as Bonnie said this morning, he is the word. In the beginning, God, you said, and you declare, Lord God, and the Holy Spirit move, mighty God. And Jesus Christ is the living word. And we come this morning to worship him and to magnify him. And Lord God, you know everything that is happening within this community. But we are thanking you, Lord God, that you will bless us. That, Lord God, that you will let us wake up, you know, just suddenly, Lord God, just suddenly, mighty God, those who are struggling with, with sickness, Lord God, those who have infirmities, those who have depressions, whatever is happening, mental illness, mighty God. Lord God, we just pray that by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you will go to their house, their hearts, their, you know, and just, just bless them, Lord. Just deliver them, Lord Jesus. We know by the Holy Spirit you cast our spirit, Lord God. And whatever is happening, Lord God, we just pray that you will help us. Lord God, according to, you know, Revelation, I just love this, this passage that said, um, I think 7 and 11, that said, Blessed be unto our God with thankfulness, with honor, with grace, with mercy, now and forever. So, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that as a community, Lord God, we all sang this morning. And I'm so excited, Lord God, because we know we have magnified your name. We have glorified your name. And Lord, we just want to give you thanks that your blessings and your wonders and your signs will come unto our community, Lord God. For you are our faithful witness. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing. For those who, uh, I, I, honestly, this is forgive me those who are getting baptized honestly i've been praying for you guys i'm so glad i'm so happy so thank you good morning uh, our scripture for today is from the book of matthew chapter 9 uh, verses 35 to 38 you can read along on page 8 
uh, on the New Testament of your pew Bible. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. We're good, I think. There's a, an Irishman, Catholic priest that I have learned to read over the years, named Edward Farrell. Farrell, um, let's walk up here, is not quite right. Anyway, Farrell often has insights that I quite like, and here's one of his. Do we see what we know, or do we know what we see? That's his Oh, or do we know what we see? So there's a difference there. And the idea is, do we see what we know? Well, then we have a certain grid that we're already working with, and we see everything through that grid, whether it's really true or not. So in fake news world, <laughs> you know, that question comes up a lot. Do we see what we know? We read our own facts the way we want to read them, or do we actually see it? Do we know what we see? And so what Farrell is implying is that's, that's where we want to be. Do we know what we see? And I, I make that statement because we're going to see Jesus seeing the crowds, and he indeed knows what he sees. So we can kind of keep that in mind as we go, uh, as we think about this text and also about what perhaps gives us meaning. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. So that's a setup verse. And I'm going to suggest that this setup verse looks both back and looks forward. So this is interesting, you may not know this, that the Bible that we read, the actual chapter divisions that we see, in the Greek, in the original text, there are no chapter divisions. And in fact, chapter divisions in our text did not actually happen until the middle of the 1300s. It's not that long ago. Before that, there were no chapter divisions. And chapter and verses that we just read now, that did not happen until really the time of the Reformation, until the mid-1500s, 1550. That's when we started seeing chapters and verses. So why is that important? Why, why, why do we care even about that? Well, if we think back towards the early days with what the, the readers of Matthew were doing, when they did not have chapter divisions, and they certainly didn't have verse ver differences, then they had to look internally for clues within the text themselves. And so the statement that we just read, if we go back to it here, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. If we look back to chapter 4, we will see pretty much that exact statement. Matthew 4.23, when Jesus begins his ministry, it's set up with this statement we just read. So it looks back to that. And now it's announced here in chapter 9, and now it's looking forward. Looking forward to Jesus' engagement with his disciples and mission. So what that means is for the early readers or thinkers of the text, this was an internal clue that a new section was starting up in the gospel because we saw it before, and now we see it again. So there are these internal clues that suggest a way of navigating the text 
before there ever were chapters and verses. Now, we find chapters and verses very helpful, right? We can say, look up Matthew 9, 35. You can find it right away. It's great. But there were hundreds and hundreds of years when that wasn't the case. So we have the benefit of that today. So this statement is looking back, and it's also looking forward. And we're looking at the threefold ministry of Jesus when we see that. And we'll just walk through this quickly to get to the emphasis in the text. But Jesus' ministry is threefold. It begins with teaching, note. So right now, we're, we're, we're doing a bit of teaching. It's not just preaching, it's teaching. We're talking about the text. We're talking about understanding it. When Jesus started his ministry, the first thing he went and did was he went into the synagogues. He went into the Jewish centers of learning in each town. That's where he began. <clears throat> and he would teach that day. There was the seat of Moses. If you went up and sat in the seat of the Moses in, in each synagogue, then you had a, an open mic, basically. And Jesus would teach. So teaching and understanding the scriptures is a very important piece. It always has been. So Jesus engages in teaching. So maybe we engage in that as well. And then there's, of course, preaching. <clears throat> preaching the good news. <clears throat> The buena nueva, the good news of the kingdom of God. It's not bad news, it's good news. It's the good news, we've been singing about it, of God's love, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion. This is all good news. So preaching is the good news of the kingdom of God. So, secondly. And then, of course, there is healing. <clears throat> and Jesus engaged in practical steps of helping people, healed people, but the early church followed in that ministry of just of helping, doing whatever they could to help people out. That is caring. And so the acts of caring demonstrate the teaching and the preaching. And so I say that because really that's the work of the church in an ongoing way. We are called to go on, carry on in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was teaching, preaching, healing. In our own way, we are invited to do the same thing. So that's how the text is set up. So it's a new section, looking back, and now it's looking ahead with the idea that Jesus wants to involve his disciples in more active ministry. That's what he wants to do here. So note, when he saw the crowds, what does Jesus see? What does he know? When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the crowds, what does Jesus see? Well, when he sees the crowd, we are told, that he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. This is a common image in the Jewish history. The Old Testament is full of it. In fact, the first example of art history we have in the Christian church in the New Testament is the picture of Jesus carrying a, sh a sheep, sheep over his shoulder. That was the first, before the crucifix, before any of that, we had Jesus as the good shepherd carrying a sheep over his shoulder. That was the very first and it makes sense because there's such an, a long history in the Old Testament showing the need for shepherds who would watch over their sheep and not be false shepherds, the true shepherds. So the first thing he does, he knows what he sees. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. We have this text that's showing this in Numbers. Interesting, this is God speaking to Moses about Joshua. Let the Lord, note, the God of the spirits of all flesh. Interesting description of God. The God of the spirits of all flesh. Appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. That's just one example of how key that idea was of a shepherd guiding and leading the sheep. So this again is God speaking to Moses. Moses now 
speaking and choosing Joshua. So the importance of that image, how does Jesus see them? He sees them as harassed or exhausted, fatigued, worn out. That's how he sees them. You ever feel worn out? <laughs> exhausted? My dad, when he came to Canada from Ireland for 12 years, he worked two jobs. Worked in a body shop downtown, full day, and then he went up to a place in Leaside to be a cleaner, and he did that for four more hours. That was his life in Canada as an immigrant for 12 years. Two jobs. And I know that he felt exhausted a lot of that time. Jesus sees him as harassed or exhausted, worn out, and helpless means put down. Literally, it's put down. People are putting them down. Certainly, we've, we've felt that way at times, feel put down by others. That's how Jesus sees them. Harassed and helpless, worn out, exhausted, and put down. That's how he sees these people. And because of that, he has compassion for them. Compassion literally means, you know it, touched in your gut. It's, 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 it's a physical reaction. When Jesus saw that, he had a physical reaction of identifying with the people in solidarity, wanting to be with them to help meet their needs. In fact, when you see that word related to Jesus, compassion, he's always going to do something. Compassion with Jesus drives him to action. Always. So Jesus sees them with compassion, moved in his gut, and so he identifies with them, in solidarity with them, and he has a desire to meet their needs. Martin Luther King Jr. in the, in the 1960s sees the community, African Americans in, in America. They, they, you know, they don't have voting rights, the basic things. He identifies with that. He wants to make a difference. He's in solidarity with them, right? You know his story. Leads, directs, guys, and ends up being shot, killed. But he took a risk to do that. He had compassion. He wanted to meet their needs. I mean, King was a brilliant man. King could have done all kinds of things. King could have got a position in Yale University or Harvard or whatever and being identified. Hey, man, big paycheck and do all that. He, he didn't do that. He identified with the people. Jesus was the model for Martin Luther King. And so he also remains our model. He, Jesus, guides, leads us, and indeed he is our good shepherd, is he not? John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. John, Jesus has seven I am statements, and this is one of them. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I know my own. People who are living like this instead of this. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father, Abba, knows me. And I know the Father. Jesus says, I know the Father. He knew the Father. He knew what he was talking about. And then he looks out and sees these people hurting and helpless. And he knows the Father cares and he also cares. To the point, I lay down my life for the sheep. It's the message of Easter. We'll see it next week. So I am the good shepherd. Jesus is our good shepherd. He identifies with us even as he identified with those people. So can we see Jesus as our good shepherd? Do we know what we see? Jesus identifies with us, loves us, cares for us. With us in all of our hassles, Jesus as our good shepherd. So I want you to hear that. I want you to know it. Jesus is your good shepherd. He cares for you even as he cared for the crowds way back when. That's how the text begins. 
So that's number one. Jesus sees, knows. Second part of the talk, or what Jesus does now, then he said to his disciples, remember he wants to engage them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask of the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is a very interesting little jewel of a scripture. Literally, it's the harvest is much, they can focus there on much, but the laborers are Few. That's it. Those are the translations. Much. Few. Jesus speaks to the disciples. The harvest, the plentiful harvest. Down in Prince Edward County in the summertime, man, the fields are just full of corn, all kinds of crops. The harvest is abundant. But he says the laborers are few. So it's a call to partner. The harvest is plentiful, but there's a shortage of workers. That's how Jesus sees it. Arlene talked about the need for workers. <laughs> I'm going to be back there, baptism next week. Yeah, come on back and see what's going on. Why not? The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. But this is not a negative statement for Jesus. We're going to see. He doesn't lay a guilt trip on them. In fact, it's an opportunity. Jesus sees this as an opportunity. This is a Kairos moment. The harvest is ready. The fields are ready, man. Go for it. I like to see what they have, the, the Toronto Raptors, and I remember the Raptors were behind, and Van Fleet, was one of their main guard, was coming off. He had just hit a three-pointer, a three and they're catching up. In his words, when he was coming off, you could see it in his mouth was, Let's go! Shoots the three-pointer. He's looking at his teammates, and he says, Let's go! We can do it! I think they lost that game. They went on and lost it. <laughs> but his idea was, Let's go! So it's the Kairos moment. It, like, come on, let's do it. This is what, in a sense, Jesus is saying. The opportunity is Kairos. Remember, there's two times of ti type of time. There's chronos, clock time, and kairos, the time of opportunity. This is the time to make a difference. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, you know what? This is our moment. This is our time. Jesus works for 30 years, lives in the little town of Nazareth, right? It's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. It's like nowheresville. And then he has three years of ministry. And here we are in the kind of the, begin, the middle of his ministry, and he's, things are ramping up, and he's saying, let's go. Let's engage. The psalmists often say this kind of word, for he is our God, God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. It's the language of today. It's the language of now. Now you hear his voice. Act on it. That's it. If you hear his voice and the Spirit begins to touch your life, even this morning, then that's a prod. Now, act on it. Because you can go home after lunch and go to sleep and not even think about it again. It's in the moment. The Spirit touches. Act on it. In C.S. Lewis's book, on which is his book on the seven devils? Oh, you know. He just taught it. What's his book? C.S. Lewis, Screw Tape Letters. You, Beth, you're supposed to help me out on those things. Not say to me, what are you talking about? <laughs> Screw Tape Letters is a senior devil talking to the young devil who's learning the trade. And he sees there's a student in a library who's reflecting on God. And he's really becoming to a point where he wants to do something about it. And the senior devil says, well, you know what you do in those situations? You, you whisper in the person's ear that he's getting hungry. Just do that. You're getting hungry. Think about this after lunch. So, student, 
Okay, I am getting a bit hungry. I'll go. So he goes off and eats his lunch. By the time he finishes his lunch, he's forgotten the whole thing about what he was thinking about spiritually. Now, today, that's it. When we hear the voice, that's when we are to respond. Don't put it off. That's the invitation. The story of abundance. And here comes the surprising move. Jesus doesn't then turn to his disciples and say, okay, I want you to go. What does he say? Pray. Interesting, your NIV Bibles and your NRSV says ask. The word is pray. The KJV gets it right. It says pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest, note, it's not our harvest, it's the Lord's harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will cast out, send out laborers into his harvest. So Jesus doesn't say to them, I want you to go and do it. The intention is that they will engage. But he doesn't say that. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest, pray that the Spirit will move in people's lives. The Lord of the harvest. That's why I've chosen this text in this bread series. What's our bread? Well, the bread is the harvest. Wheat. Eventually we get bread. Will we eat the bread and receive the nutrition of God for our lives? And then as a result of that, engage in whatever way God is asking us to do it, whatever that way is. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out labors into his harvest field. I think in the area of Weston, we have an opportunity to let go, as Van Fleet said. Let's go. Let's do it. Weston is an amazing area, is it not? I mean, why do you come to church here, in, in this area? I mean, what's your, what's, why? There's lots of churches you could go elsewhere, but you're here. And there's lots of stuff, the area is changing. Big time change. And in the middle of this, if Jesus looked around at all this place and all these people from all over the world, I think he would see this as a harvest, an abundant harvest that's ready to be reaped in whatever way we see that. It's a lot richer of an area, I'll tell you, in terms of its energy than the area where Beth and I live. We live in Etobicoke, boring area. There's nowhere to get a coffee. You can walk 20 minutes up the street to go to Tim Hortons, but I mean, you know, it's not even a real Tim Hortons. It's in the gas station. It's one of those little guys. It's useless. This area is amazing. Everybody from all over the world, all kinds of interesting foods all around here. Boring, middle of Etobicoke. Don't go out that way. This is, this, is, this is cool, man. A lot going on here. The harvest. Hi, how are you? Thought you got something to show me. Cool. Let's see. Oh, I like that. Yeah, basketball. High scores, man. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go. Let's do it. So the harvest is full, the labors are few. So we need to hear that. What is Jesus saying into the midst of that as we conclude, as we go on? Going forward, three points. Jesus is our good shepherd. We need to hear that. The Buena Nueva. Christ is our good shepherd, your good shepherd. In the middle of hassles, Donet was recognizing that people, people very sick in our community. And, and we need to know that Jesus is our good shepherd even as we go through that. Things happen, stuff happens in life. But Jesus is our good shepherd. So we need to hear that and receive it. It's not a picture of scarcity. It's a picture of abundance. If we go forward next, next door, it's, ab it's about abundance, not scarcity. Lots of excellent, exciting, good things can happen in our midst and will. Kairos moment. Today, now, 
the psalmist says. And then thirdly, we're invited to become partners with God. In whatever way that is. So what does it mean for you? The harvest is much, but the laborers are few. I mean, Jesus asks it. We have to think about it. It's not up to me to tell you what that might be for you. You have to do that. I have to do it. The harvest is much, the laborers are few, Jesus says. Okay, can I hear that, and what does that mean for me? As I eat the bread of nutrition. So, we come back to the question we asked right at the top. What gives our lives meaning? That's what we were saying. Bonnie referenced that in her opening. What gives life meaning? Well, I think a good chunk of meaning comes, one, by us being in relationship with God. To know God as our creator. To know him. I'm creature. He's creator. To know that. Creatures know that. You know, they, they have a sense, not cognition-wise, but they, creatures know how they fit in the universe, I think. They're not just, they're not wandering around asking me, you know, a pilot whale, what's the meaning of my life, right? They're, 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 they know the meaning of their life. Enjoy the waters, do their thing, that's the meaning. We have to think about it. So what's the meaning of your life? Well, to know God, to know him as creator, and then even to push that through beyond to know Jesus, his son, his presence in my life, your life, and what's the invitation for that? To walk with him, to be his friend. Not just a disciple, but to be a friend. And then to live your life with that kind of draw. So life is more than your, your, your job, right? Life is more than your career. Life is asking questions about your vocation. I remember hearing someone saying that, you know, our students go to school and no one's ever asking them what is your true vocation, what's your vocation in life. What they talk about is your career. What's a good career? How can you make a lot of money? Or at least make a good money? That's the whole focus. Nobody's asking people, what is your meaning, purpose in life, vocation? School system has given up on that. Don't even go there. So we're asking that. What is God saying to me, and what will fulfill my life in meaning? In your area, in your discipline, whatever your chosen field is, how are you there, a child of God and a friend of Jesus? As we ask those questions, we will receive more and more and more a sense of meaning and purpose, I believe. To know God, to know Christ. In our music, in our services, in our virtual services, I've been using the music of Valerie and Trevor, Valerie Ransom. These are my cousins, right? So when you see them leading and singing, there's a connection, at least for me. And they're out there and they're doing some music. Valerie has said I can use her music, so I use her music. First Baptist Church in Nanaimo. Their little tagline, for not them, for the whole church, is to know God and to make him known. So I know Allison watches these service. Hello, Allison. <laughs> to know God and to make him known. Now that's, you know, that's a pretty good tagline. To know him and then somehow wanting to pass that on to others. So maybe there is something in this that can speak to your purpose and meaning and deeper vocation and calling. I believe there is. What does the Spirit say to you and to me in these moments? In Jesus' name. Next week is going to be an amazing week. It's Palm Sunday. We're going to wave our palms. People are being baptized. It's going to be joyful. By the way, we're not doing communion next week. We're doing it on Good Friday. That's the focus. Celebration. So may we hear, may we say yes, not live like this, live like this, in Jesus' name. We'll ask the musicians.
I really wasn't sure if we were going to stop or keep going. That was amazing. And done it to your point, in my new living translation, this is one of my favorite uh, benedictions, and we actually used to sing it. But here you go. And it starts out a prayer of praise. And now all glory to God who is able to keep you from stumbling, who will bring you into his glorious presence, innocent of sin and with great joy. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, glory, majesty, power, and authority belong to him in the beginning, now, and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>